Take your Bible, if you would, turn to Exodus chapter 1, if you would, please, and read along with me. I've got, as usual, I have a lot of scripture verses. Uh, I'm going to lay the foundation of what may end up being a new uh, sermon series. And uh, so help me pray about that. Um, and um, it, it, as I was praying about what to preach this morning, what to bring before you this morning, um, I was thinking a little bit about Thanksgiving and what it was. And I, I don't always preach, like if we have a holiday or whatever, I don't always try to find a sermon to match that holiday. Uh, it just depends on, you know, the leading of the Lord. I've changed messages uh, like on the way to church, sometimes I've had messages, God changed them for me or whatever. Uh, but this is something that God laid on my heart. And I want you to think of uh, what we're going to what we're going to lay the foundation for this morning. Uh, I, I call this. What did I call it last night? It's not what I called the file name, but. Um, we could call this those who seek a better place in a better way. So I want you to think about that, and I want you to think of your life as it is right now. And ask yourself the question, could things in my life be better? Could they be better? Um, I am going to, in the course of this series, maybe, and maybe even today, deal with the area of addictions. Right now, because of the uh, immense wisdom of the people of the state of Missouri, we now have legalized illegal drugs in the state of Missouri, and I'm speaking of marijuana. We will. I uh, appreciate you letting me know that. Um, there was a time in some of your, some of you have seen a time when for someone to say that marijuana would be legalized throughout most of the country for not just for medicinal use, but for recreational use, you would have laughed and said, there ain't no way. Ain't no way. But now it's happened. And let me tell you what, let me tell you what's happened. You say, well, you know, people just, you know, the government wants to tax it and they're just getting money out of it. I don't see the harm. Let me tell you the harm because I experienced it firsthand. I saw it in my family. Now that the, the now that marijuana for recreational use has been legalized. And yes, they put down guidelines for how you're supposed to carry it in your car and all that stuff. That don't mean anything to most people. They're just playing roulette with the fact that they probably won't get pulled over and checked on. And even if they did, they're looking at a ticket versus some serious crime. Marijuana used to be a serious crime. And now it's just a way of life. And let me tell you what a doctor told me here recently. You see, you think that people are now going to buy their marijuana at these dispensaries. People are still buying street marijuana. And what's happening is that street marijuana to a guy who's dealing it, there is a chance nine times out of ten that that marijuana is going to be laced with fentanyl. Why would they do that? To increase the effect of it and to get people who are smoking it hooked on it. Because you can sell marijuana to a guy one time and you make one money. You can turn him into an addict and he'll be coming back at you almost every day for another hit. And so that's what we've done. That's what we've turned loose in this country. And again, I'm not, I'm not just speaking out of the side of my head. I have seen it first 
hand. I know exactly that that's, what, that's what's happened. And uh, so it, it is a shame. So you have people now, and marijuana has been and always will be a gateway drug. Because once you don't, once you had enough of getting high with marijuana, all somebody has to do is say, man, you ought to try this, it's better. And that's what's going on. It is reached because more and more parents are doing it in their home. The age at which young people will be making use of marijuana is getting lower and lower and lower all the time. So you have people addicted to marijuana and they say marijuana is not addictive. Well, if you add fentanyl, it is. If not addictive chemically or biologically, you get addicted to getting high. And you want to feel that feeling. And you don't, you don't want anything else. You want that feeling again. So we have people getting hooked on drugs more and more and more now in this country and in the state of Missouri, in our neighborhoods, in our subdivisions, in our backyards. We have more and more people getting addicted to drugs. And they're doing it in a, in a much bigger way. By the way, the marijuana now that's grown is a lot stronger and a lot more intense than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. People getting hooked on pharmaceutical drugs. That's why the state of Missouri had to step up and pass laws. That's why you can't hardly get anything for pain after you have surgery now. And it's because the pharmaceutical companies, what is the, what is the root of all evil? I forgot. The love of money. The pharmaceutical companies, I know it for a fact, was paying behind the back those doctors who would write subscriptions for opioids. So they were getting money for you for a doctor visit, plus they were getting kickbacks on every script that they wrote for these opioids. And they got everybody hooked. I've seen documentaries where people will say, without fail, those who end up on heroin will almost always say, it all started when I had a car wreck. It all started when I had a fall. Or it all started after I had surgery and they gave me strong pain meds. And then the pain meds ran out. And so I started getting more. Then I started buying them off the street. And then somebody told me that heroin was a better high anyway, so switch over to that. And then you got people dead. Everywhere. So we have people addicted to drugs. We have more and more people addicted to alcohol. Young people. Children. Hooked on alcohol. Uh, hooked on booze. Um, I'm going to say this and I'm going to try to approach it in a PG rated setting. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, the, uh, because of Interpol and because of uh, international treaties and so on, uh, and because of how difficult it was back then to produce this stuff and get away with it. Uh, I'm going to use the phrase uh, juvenile images. And you all know what that means. The juvenile image trade in this world was all but eradicated. Late 80s, early 90s. Until the internet came. Now you have, now you have men, women, college students, teenagers, and even children involved in the trade of juvenile images. There are several channels on YouTube where People will set up kind of like um, what Chris Hansen did with, on Dateline NBC to catch a predator. 
Well, you got a bunch of people on, on YouTube who are doing that, and they're, doing, they're pretty successful. They, they, they take chat logs of people who, are, who, people who are looking for juveniles. And only for juveniles. And one of these guys said it never fails. As soon as our imposter gets on one of these apps and poses as somebody who's 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8 years old, wham! All of a sudden you have guys from everywhere wanting to start chatting up this decoy. And they go, they find out where the guy lives, they go, they go to his house, they got cameras on him, and they say, hey, we got to talk to you about this. And invariably the police show up because somebody called the police, the police will show up and they arrest these people and their life is ruined. And I'm going to tell you that a, a, a very, very disturbing, man, I hate to even say stuff like this, a very disturbing trend is that in the marketplace of juvenile images, you're talking about one and two year old. See, it's not just the Catholic priest anymore doing this stuff. It's everywhere and it's affecting every family. And you can play, like I say, you can play roulette with the government on this one. You can say, well, I can, I can get by with it. Nobody's going nobody's to check on me. Nobody's going to see what I'm doing. You're just the fool who thinks that nobody's watching. But let me tell you, God is. And God has already said, be sure your sin will find you out. That's what God said. So we have addictions. We have people addicted to practically every ill thing that we can think of in this country. Now, those, some, some of those people want a better life. Some of them do. Some of the people who are hooked on drugs, they don't want to be. But they don't know any other way. They want a better life. Some of those that are hooked on alcohol, I'll, I'll, I don't believe smoking or using tobacco is a sin. The Bible doesn't mention it as a sin, but it certainly ain't good for you. And I'll, I'll just throw in cigarettes here too. And uh, vapes and all that stuff. That stuff ain't good for you. And like I said, I'm not saying it's a sin because the Bible doesn't say anything about it. But it's just part of the corruption of this world to get people hooked on stuff that they can't get off of. And they make them consumers for the rest of their life. But anyway, people hooked on drugs, people hooked on alcohol, people hooked on all kinds of either real adultery or homosexuality or uh, the marketplace of hundreds of thousands of websites that deal in nothing but the uh, imagery of fornication. And that's the world we live in. And I'm not, I am not so naive as to think that it doesn't affect anybody in this church. I, just because I don't know who it might affect in this church doesn't mean that I don't think that it does affect anybody in this church. The way it goes in this world, how can you escape the clutches of this world? How can you? Especially when it is so prevalent and so readily available even to our children. Shoot. You've got, you've got um, school boards that are making sure that the most vile, disgusting lifestyles are praised and forced upon even first graders. And I, let's, I like this. 
Parents now are showing up at school board meetings waiting for their chance to speak. And they'll say, let me read to you a book that my son brought home from the school library that librarian encouraged him to read. And he'll be reading explicit language in a school board. And it's funny when the school board say, oh, excuse me, sir, you can't use that kind of language. And this say, wait a minute. He's reading it in school and he got it from your library. Bunch of idiots. But anyway, so are there people who want a better life? Yes. Are there people who are in bondage right now? Yes. And there are some people we're going to... Well, if I keep preaching the way I'm preaching, we won't find out nothing today. Turn to Exodus 1, verse 7. There are people... I mean, you're going to find out a couple things today. Number one, there are people who want you in bondage. There's a God who can free you from bondage. But you have to want to be free. Exodus chapter 1, verse 7. The children of Israel were fruitful. And the devil looks at that and says, well, we can't have that. We can't have more churches. We can't have more people getting saved. We can't have this. We can't have Christianity thriving in this country. They were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Boy, that is a liberal's nightmare, isn't it? A whole country full of Bible-thumping Christians. Amen. Closing down all the beer joints and everything like that. Making sure that Sunday sales goes back to what it used to be. You don't buy on Sunday. Amen. I mean, going back to some old-fashioned things that, we used to, that used to exist in this country. They don't want that. And so a plan is hatched. If we can't if we can't stop the Christians from multiplying, then we'll just lock them up in chains of bondage that they can't get out of. So verse 8, Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. Let me stop right here. Let me draw your attention to something. If you pull in, if you just kind of go west from here or south or north in the state of Missouri and just start driving uh, some, of the, some of the smaller uh, state highways, not 44, not 55, not 70, but start driving some of these uh, smaller, smaller highways throughout the state of Missouri, and you pull through some town in Missouri that has a population like 6,000, 8,000, 10,000, or whatever. What is the ratio of Christian churches to Muslim mosques in those towns? 100 to 0. You're going to find... Christian churches in these towns, you're not going to find a mosque anywhere. And now look at what we just read. They are more than us. And we can't have that. So a plan was hatched years ago to make sure that these Christian churches have absolutely zero impact in their communities. Jesus warned us of that. He said, uh, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, it is therefore good for what? Nothing. And I'll tell you what, we got a lot of good for nothing churches now. So, verse 11. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. You know, I always question that. I know it was the plan of God, so God allowed it, and God basically made sure it happened. But my question was, why didn't the Israelites, as they were increasing, make them a bunch of swords and spears? Because if you're more, as a nation, the Jews here, than the Egyptians are, all you got to do is beat them. And they're going to put you in bondage. 
I don't know. I don't know exactly what happened. I just know that the Israelites found themselves in chains of bondage one day. Verse 11, again, they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word this morning. I thank you for it. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would open up our eyes. And Father, I do pray, Lord, for anybody, anybody that is in bondage this morning, that is in chains, that is being afflicted. The devil does not want them to have any effect in their family, in their own home, in their community, on the job site, at the warehouse, at the storehouse the schoolhouse, they don't want Christian principles to be prevalent amongst our society. They don't want that. And there are people, Lord, who want to place us in chains of bondage. And, oh, Father, how easily our sins do beset us, as Paul said. How easy is it for us to get pulled away in temptations, various lusts, until the devil has us and we have absolutely no effect. We have absolutely no war-fighting skills to fight for what's true and to fight for what's right. And we've become a mockery to this world. The world just laughs at Christians when they fall. And Father, we've turned a corner so much in this country that we now have liberals leading children out cursing your people Israel. So Father, I pray, dear God, for anybody who's listening to my voice today who finds themselves admitting to themselves that they are in chains of bondage and they cannot Father, you know they cannot break those chains on their own. They've tried. It must be you who makes them free. Father, bless the message. Lord, I pray to your God that you would allow me to carry it for as long, Lord, as you want it to go. Or as short as you want it to go. It doesn't matter to me. It's your word. These are your people. This is your message. I pray that you'd bless it now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Look back up here at verse, um, verse 12. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. But look at after that. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. But uh, let's see here. That I, it's verse 14 is what I want you to look. And they made their lives bitter. You know, the addictions that we get ourselves on whether it's drugs prescription drugs cigarettes alcohol uh, fornication adultery imagery and all of that stuff it all sounds good at the beginning it all feels good at the beginning it all looks good at the beginning and some people even justify it and say, well, I, I'm, it's, it's right that I do this. I've had experiences with, with men who told me that they felt like that they, God, it wasn't God's will for them to be married to their wife any longer. That, that they, it wasn't their soulmate, that God actually had somebody else for them. So they were going to divorce their wife and, just, and have their mistress move in with them. I've actually had people tell me that, that I worked with. And I'm just going, you're an idiot. I mean, I didn't say it to him, but you know, I wanted to preserve my face for the long run, okay? I didn't get hit. But I, and I'm like, you're an idiot. Amen. Amen. It's God's will. Or people who justify 
uh, the, this illegal drug use. Oh, God wants me on marijuana. God wants me on marijuana three times a day. That's, that's helping me. Good grief. And so people end up in bondage. And after they've been in bondage for several years, and it's taken its toll on their marriage, on their family, on their health, on their, their workability, on everything that they have going for them, then they want help. But sad to say, most people never find it. I've already had at least one person that I know out of this church in days past die of a drug overdose. Somebody that I loved very much. There are other people that I know of, people that you are related to, that I know that they're in horrendous sin addictions. And I just wonder sometimes if they even want help. Because the way they act and the way they live doesn't indicate to me that they want to stop doing what they're doing. And that's, that's where I'm going with this. I want you to, I've laid the foundation for you this morning is that the devil sees God's plan of salvation working in somebody's life, that God is building a kingdom, that Christ is going to come, he's going to fulfill prophecy in Revelation chapter 19, the Lord is going to come with ten thousands of his saints, and he's going he's to put down all the ungodliness in this world, he's going to reign for a thousand years. That's what the Bible teaches, what it says, you know, so I believe what the Bible says. I believe Jesus is coming back, amen? Oh, I can't wait for it. Hurry up. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, is what the Bible says. So the devil sees that. and He says, I'm going to launch an attack. I'm going to put all of God's people in bondage. I'm going to put the churches in bondage. I'm going to put uh, all the pastors in bondage so that they will not be able to preach against certain things and preach against, what's, uh, w preach against what's wrong and preach for what's right. I'm going to put them in bondage to money. I'm going to put them in bondage to sins. I'm gonna, and, and listen, I've had friends in the ministry that are gone. Gone. Some of that I was just reminiscing the other day. Some of the guys that I went to Bible college with. Several of them have turned out to be homosexuals. One of them that I know was... He ended up going after his own daughters. Others that I know of are still in the ministry, but they've fought battles against their flesh. So I'm here to tell you it affects preachers just as much as it affects those who are in the pews. So here's, here's the devil now. He's going to put you in bondage. But God does have a better way. Turn to Exodus 3. Now this is what I want you to concentrate on and Exodus 3, verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. God knows it. God knows it. God knows it. And he said, I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I like that phrase. I like it when God said, I know their sorrows. Jesus was the man of sorrows. He said, I know their sorrows and I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, let me stop right here. God will come down and deliver you. However, it is a mistake on your part to think that you can still live in Egypt and have the blessings of Canaan. Any, anybody who works in the addictions industry in this country, and I didn't mention gambling. I didn't mention gambling. Good. Grief. We created 
by the stroke of the legislator's pen and the signing off of the governor of the state of Missouri, we have created a whole industry of addictions to gambling in this country. I mean, didn't anybody see this coming? If you open up casinos, you're going to get hooked, people hooked on gambling. They're going to sit, listen, I go into gas stations now, and they put in them stupid slot machines now. The lottery slot machines in the gas station. I just see people sitting there going, bam, 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 bam. Sit there, as long as I'm in the gas station getting my soda pop or whatever it is, they're just sitting there, mashing that button. And I see up on the screen that they've deposited $25. Bam, bam, bam. They're going to lose 25 bucks sitting there. But you know what? They get addicted to it. You know, what God, you know what happens? Watch this. God lets them win once. You, said, what, you didn't say that right. No, I said it right. God lets them win once. And then they think, oh, wow, boy, God must be in this. And I, I, I want to do it some more. I think I'm good at this. You're good at what? Mashing a button? So you keep doing it. And then all of a sudden, you not only lose the money that you had, that you won, but now you're going in debt. Now listen, it's a sickness. It is a disease just like everything else is. Or an addiction is what I meant to say. It is an addiction. It's a sin addiction. It's vices. And woe, woe be the day when the county government of Jefferson County finally votes to put in a casino either in Kimswick or somewhere else in this county. They're going to do it and say, boy, look at all the revenue we're going to get in. The love of money is the root of all evil. So God wants to deliver, but you're going to have to leave Egypt. You're going to have to leave behind some friends. You're going to have to quit going to some places. You're going to have to quit a certain lifestyle. You're going to have to have Someone help you get through this because as long as you are left to make decisions on your own, you will never vote for yourself to do better. Your flesh will always vote for the sin every single time. So God says, yes, I, I've got a deliverance for you, but you're going to have to leave Egypt. And we're going to find out as soon as I get to the message. That uh, not everybody wants to leave Egypt. So verse 9. Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptian oppressed them. Come now therefore and I will send thee unto Pharaoh. That thou mayest bring forth my people the children of Israel out of Egypt. Sounds good. So let me now let me turn this to more a Thanksgiving theme. Thanksgiving. Um is a, believe it or not, history's been rewritten, but Thanksgiving is a solely Christian holiday. How, how can I say that? I mean, I just did it, right? It is a uniquely Christian holiday. It wasn't just some people came over to do something somewhere. The way the liberals say it. It is God's people came. And I want you to follow now the, the path that they went. They crossed the sea to get to a land flowing with milk and honey. Did you hear what I just said? They crossed the sea to get to a land flowing with milk and honey. The land that they were in had no milk and no honey. Well, it did if you were the right kind of church member, if you were part of the Church of England, or you were part of the uh, Church of Rome, the Vatican's church. Then, then, I mean, you got the milk and the honey. But the land here is flowing with milk and honey. It's across the sea, and you're going to see that. I'm going to show you the quotations of some of the men who were part of laying the, the framework and the groundwork of what was to be a Christian nation here in this land. 
William Brewster, the founder of the Plymouth Colony. That is, he came over on the Mayflower, signed the Mayflower Compact, if you remember that. The Mayflower Compact was a way to have a government on the people as soon as they left the ship. You see, while they're on the ship, there's no need to form a government because the governor of the ship is the captain. You do what the captain says. And they didn't just get off the ship and say, no, everybody, every man for himself. No, 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 no. Before they set foot off the Mayflower, they signed an agreement that said, once we get on the land, we are going to form such laws and statutes as befit our colony to help rule and guide and govern our colony. And they all signed it. So that when they went over and actually landed on land, now there is a government in force. Man must need to be governed. Amen. So watch this. William Brewster said this concerning the first pilgrims that landed at Plymouth Rock. He said they shook off the yoke of anti-Christian bondage. You know what he's referring to? Israel and Egypt. But he was speaking of the pilgrims who came from Holland, from England, from other places in Western Europe and came to this land so that they wouldn't be persecuted anymore for, my goodness, for believing the Bible. Amen. You know what? You know what's coming down the pike? You're about to be persecuted for believing the Bible. You ready to handle it? You ready to stand up with it? You ready to face it? It's coming. They've already marched in D.C. in protest to a certain people's religion and a certain people's race. So they shook off the yoke of anti-Christian bondage and as the Lord's free people joined themselves by a covenant of the Lord into a church estate in the fellowship of the gospel to walk in all his ways made known or to be made known unto them according to their best endeavors whatsoever it should cost them the Lord assisting them. Now I almost guarantee you you did not hear this taught to you in your school concerning thanksgiving. All I heard when I was, I went to Festus and that was back in the 70s, but all I heard was pilgrims. Pilgrims and this makes a turkey. Amen. Okay. That's all I heard. It wasn't until I started studying it out that I realized, hey, they were coming over here to escape the bondage that they were under to come and be free to serve the Lord as they saw fit. Amen. In 1629, when a church was founded at Salem in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, William Brewster made this comment. The church that had been brought over the ocean. I'm telling you, when those pilgrims came over from Europe and landed on these shores, they saw themselves as the Israelites leaving Goshen coming across the sea into a new land. And by the way, what did God give them when they got to this, when they got across the sea? What did God give them? A written copy of His Word. Okay? If you look at the dates, this Bible was first published in 1611. And if you look at the dates, the Great Migration began 1619, 1620. I'll get to that. The church that had been brought over the ocean now saw another church, the firstborn in America, holding the same faith in the same simplicity of self-government under Christ alone. In June 1630, 10 years after the Pilgrims founded the Plymouth Colony, Governor John Winthrop founded the Holy Commonwealth of Massachusetts with 700 people sailing in a... Listen, the Kennedys would have fallen out of their high chairs if they would have found out that not only was Massachusetts a Christian colony, it was a Protestant colony. Amen. In 11 ships, this began the Great Migration, which saw more than 20,000 Puritans embark for New England in the pursuing 16 years. 
On June 11, 16 to 30, but aboard the Arbella, John Winthrop authored this work, A Model of Christian Charity, which became a guideline for future constitutional covenants of the colonies. Now here's what, in part what it said. If the Lord shall please to hear us and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then hath he ratified this covenant and sealed our commission. We'll expect a strict performance of the articles. The Lord will surely break out in wrath against us. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us. When ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies. He just quoted scripture. And not any scripture. It was words given to Moses that Moses gave to the Israelites just before they were fixing to enter into Canaan land. He said, a ten of you shall be able to chase a thousand of your enemies. It's in the book of Deuteronomy, I believe. When he shall make us a praise and a glory that men of succeeding plantations shall say, the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. Where did he get that phrase from? The Bible, Jerusalem, the eyes of all people are upon us so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work, we have undertaken and so caused him to withdraw his present help from us. We shall be made a story and a byword through the world. I think that's Deuteronomy 29, if I remember right. William Bradford said this, what could now sustain them but the spirit of God and his grace? May not and ought not the children of these fathers rightly say, our fathers were Englishmen which came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness. And he mentioned Deuteronomy 26. But they cried unto the Lord and he heard their voice and looked upon their adversity. And Deuteronomy 26, these verses that he pointed out say this. And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and became there a great na a nation, great, mighty and populous. And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. They were referring to what the Church of England and the Church of Rome, the, the punishments. You could even lose your life for being a Protestant. And when he cried unto the Lord of God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. Our forefathers believed that they were like Israel leaving Egypt, coming to a new world. Thomas, even Thomas Jefferson, who was not a Christian, said this in his second inaugural address. I shall need to, I shall need to the favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our forefathers as Israel of old. Do you see what he said? He led our forefathers just like he did Israel from their native land and planted them in a country flowing with all the necessities and comforts of life, who was covered who has covered our infancy with his providence and our riper years with his wisdom and power and to whose goodness I ask you to join with me in supplications that he will so enlighten the minds of your servants, guide their counsels and prosper their measures that whatever they shall result in your good and shall secure to you, to you the peace, friendship and approbation of all nations. Basically, Thomas Jefferson also believed that our founding pilgrim forefathers were just like Israel coming over into this land. How many of you have never heard anything like that before? Raise your hand. Several of you. When God showed me this, I wept. What has happened to our country? What has happened to its foundations? Did not the Bible warn us that the, if the foundations be destroyed, wherewith shall the righteous stand? And that's what's happened. They came over here to build a nation under God. A Christian nation that would be full of the laws of the scriptures governing its inhabitants. That's what they came over here for. 
very, very quickly, as the devil does, he sees it in its infancy and knows that he better destroy it while it's young. Are you catching this? Did not Pharaoh want to kill the babies? Did not Herod want to kill the babies? Does not the dragon stand before the woman who's ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it's born? You know what I, as, as a minister, among other ministers, you know what we ministers know? That when somebody comes to the Lord, there's a fairly better than average chance they won't make it. In spite of everything that we try to do for them, and every program and every Bible study and every church service and every sermon we preach, there's a better than average chance they won't make it. And usually the devil gets them in their infancy. Now, look at your Bible. Look at this verse up here. Guess who the pilgrims are? Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 said, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers, and we're the pilgrims. We're the ones now who seek a better way, don't we? You see, let me just mention, well, I don't know. If YouTube hears me, they might, they might throw me out. Some people believe that, that Trump was going to be the savior of America. I'm sorry, America only needs one savior. Now, I, listen, I, I like the things that he did while he was president. But I've learned not to put my hopes on that. I've learned that. The kind of revival that I want for America doesn't end after four years of a president. It keeps on going. But remember what I said. You must be willing to leave Egypt. Let me um, share this with you and I'll take the baloney roll and cut it off right here. Turn to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2 and then if you want to, Acts chapter 7. Because I'm going to be in both places. I'm going to read them to you, bam, bam. Tell you what they mean and send you home to dinner. Some people don't want deliverance. They don't. They say they do. But in reality, they're not willing to leave Egypt. Not willing to leave the leeks and the onions. They're just not willing. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out into his brethren. Now remember, Moses at this time has, has grown up in Pharaoh's house. In fact, I, I want to share this with you. You remember how the Bible says of Moses that he chose the afflictions of his people rather than the pleasures of sin for a season. Had Moses not chosen... To follow God when God called. Do you know what would have happened to Moses? He would have ended up at the bottom of the Red Sea. Chasing God's people into his own destruction. That's what would have happened to him. So it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out into his brethren. He knows he's a Jew and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Listen, our brethren are here among us. Our brethren are in this nation. Our brethren live in this state. Our brethren, our people are here right among us. And it ought to grieve our soul to see what the devil has done and how he has destroyed this nation. It ought to grieve our soul. 
All you got to do is just look at how people thought and how people lived back in, back after Pearl Harbor. Back during the days of World War II, when so many of our boys were not coming home ever again. When parents were weeping over their sons, giving their lives for the freedom of our country. Back in a day when it was, there were certain things that were just immoral and you didn't do them. So, verse 12, he looked this way. He saw an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, the two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Well, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? And he said, uh, Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. And he had to flee. Moses was, in fact, we're going to go to Acts chapter 7. We're going to find out Moses was 40 years old. So you know, I've already mentioned that number 4 and the number 40. It represents the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in that number 4, or this, in this case 40, Moses was 40 when he sought to save his people the first time. And the first time, they rejected him. Are you hearing where I'm going with this? So he's going to come back 40 years later and save them again. Only this time it's going to work. Did you hear that? I'm telling you, Christ is coming again. And when he does, Hamas better watch out. And all the liberals in all the colleges, they better watch out. Amen. He's coming with a sword in one hand and a pen in the other. He said, I'm going to be taking down names. Moses, now watch this, Acts chapter 7. This is what Stephen preached to the Jews. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. That's a picture of Christ. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. You know what, I, you know what I'd like to do? As your pastor. I would like to see whatever is smiting you, whatever is afflicting you, whatever has power over you. I, as your pastor, would love to see it with my own eyes. God conquering your enemies while I stand behind this pulpit. There is no greater thing that I want to see than for those who struggle, those who suffer, those who are in chains of bondage, for God to make them free. I'm just telling you, that's what I'd like to see. I'd be willing to kill the Egyptian. Not, I'm not, not going to kill anybody, but... Verse 25, For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again. In other words, he said, let's get along, we're brethren. Set them at one again, but um, saying, sirs, ye are brethren, and why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Would thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian and where he begat two sons. I'm telling you that God is willing to save. God is willing to deliver you out of the bondage that you're in, no matter what it is. No matter how bad it is. No matter how evil it is. God is willing to deliver you. Just like He delivered our pilgrim forefathers. Just like He delivered our Israeli forefathers. Our spiritual forefathers, Israel. Just like he has delivered countless others. Who in here 
would raise your hand and say with your hand, God has certainly delivered me out of some awful things and I'm free today. Look around you. Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. We'll shout and sing. We'll walk and talk. I want some more of that song. Thank you for that, JR. I appreciate that. You can give me 20 bucks later, all right? Listen, I know what it's like to be in bondage, and I know what it's like to be free. Being free is a whole lot better. But like I said, you got to be willing to leave Egypt. And I have found that no matter, sometimes, no matter how many times somebody come down to the altar, they're not ready to leave Egypt. Would you bow your heads?